Okay, over to you. Great, uh, so I'm just going to get started. Um, so hi everyone, just uh, on behalf of Migrants United, uh, I want to welcome you all to today's event on this uh, rainy day in London. Uh, my name is Beatrice Lacerda Ratton and I'm a member of Migrants United. Uh, we want to fight for real democracy, uh, which we understand is effective power to the people in the economic, political and social spheres. Uh, we are committed to contributing to the society where we live, helping to fight racism, xenophobia, homophobia, sexism and with an internationalist spirit. So I'm going to be chairing the event today and I'll introduce the guests and the discussion very shortly. But first of all, I just want to share uh, some of the technical information with you about the operation of Zoom. So I know some of us are less familiar than others with Zoom. So please all bear with me while I try and go quickly through a few tips. If you have any questions about this, please use the chat or raise your hand and I'll tell you in a minute how you can do these things. So uh, please keep your microphone muted while, every, while someone else is talking. Um, at the bottom left of your screen, you have a camera and a microphone sign. If you're on a computer, just hover the mouse. If you're on a tablet or phone, just touch on the screen and the buttons will light up. If they are crossed off, it means you are muted and not sharing your camera. Uh, I encourage people to share their videos so we can see each other, but please keep your microphone off unless it's your turn to speak. If you do want to speak, uh, please raise a virtual hand. To do this, use the raise hand button, which can be found on the bottom center, and you'll open a window or side menu, depending on your device. You may also find your raise hand button by clicking the three dots next to your name. Uh, so chat, you can message the whole group or you can send a message to people individually if you want to greet or speak to someone privately or to one of the moderators. Uh, Francisco and Paolo will be the people to message for technical issues and Liliana or me will be the people to message for comments and questions in relation to the discussion and intervention. If you are on a computer or some tablets, you can use gallery view and see lots of us at the same time. The op other option is speaker view in which you will see the person speaking and only four or five of the other participants. Uh, please be aware that this meeting is public and will be recorded and streamed live in our Facebook page where people can also ask questions. So if you're watching this through Facebook Live, please ask your questions in the comments. Again, if you have any questions, please send them to Francisco, Paolo, Liliana or my after my introduction, we'll start with the short interventions from our guests, which we encourage you to make any comments or ask questions in the chat. After they've spoken, we will open up for interventions from the audience. I will ask then for you to raise your hands if you want to participate, and we encourage as many of you um, as possible to participate. So let me first introduce uh, all of our guests. So we have Manuel Cortes. Um, Hello. We have... Hello, hi Manuel. Uh, we have Margaret Ostagier, I think I'm saying that right. Hi Margaret. Um, hi. Um, we have Sarah Scuzzarello and uh, we've got Don Flynn. So I'll do a short introduction um, about each of them before their interventions. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction on the debate and then we'll get started um, on our speakers. So the title of the event today is Mobility and Labour, Migrants in the Pandemic. We don't really want to make this an overly academic debate about the concepts, but when we discuss difficult political issues, it is important that we use words that mean the same for everyone. Uh, the restrictions of travel that have been imposed in the last few months are disproportionately affecting people who have their lives distributed across borders and cannot visit family, be joined by loved ones, work from home, or return temporarily lest they be called back to work without notice. But these restrictions have only been discussed and challenged predominantly on the grounds that they affect tourists and damage the industries that depend on tourism. The ways in which lockdowns have conditioned everyday labor mobilities 
have particularly affected migrants. So on the one hand, we are much more likely to be the precarious frontline food and delivery workers that have kept our city cities going. On the other hand, many have been caught by the pandemic in a foreign country without work and without the ability to travel back. Uh, being a high proportion of the precarious labor force, migrants are also more likely to have precarious residential arrangements and be displaced during the coming economic recession. As people with experience of more than one nation, uh, we as migrants have a privileged point of view on many of the political challenges that we are facing. It could be said that we come from the future, having experienced the effects of previous crises that have devastated the peripheries of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. We are therefore in a unique position to participate in the debates and struggles that are about to hit all European societies simultaneously. So in the current atmosphere of border fetishism, migrants risk being even more disenfranchised from the democratic processes, both in the countries of origin and in the countries of arrival. The only way that our voice will be heard is if we make ourselves heard. So this is what we're trying to uh, begin today. So once again, we want to welcome you to this event and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our international panel. So uh, just giving uh, some background on Manuel Cortes. He is a trade unionist who has served as the General Secretary of the Transport Salaried Staff Association, the TSSA, since 2011, and he's uh, very well known in the trade union movement. So over to you, Manuel. Okay, th thank you very much, Chair. And can I also thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak. I'm delighted to be joining you today. And I think the opening remarks from the chair have really put a context into this. Clearly, migrant workers at the moment could be stuck in countries without having the ability to go and rejoin the family, the friends, and the loved ones. And of course, we, we had a certain amount of our membership because we're a public transport union and we have quite a lot of people who are first or second generation migrants who work within public transport. People who, for example, were visiting India when the outbreak of coronavirus hit Europe and some of them, it took them months to be able to come back and we had to bargain with employers about them making sure that they kept their jobs. But clearly, you know, the employers didn't want to pay them either. So this caused economic strain as well. So there's the two sides to this. It's those people who were, for example, in Britain when the pandemic hit and we had the lockdown and those people who were away from Britain at that point and who were unable to come back. But I tell you what, my, my greatest fear now is clearly not on the health side. Clearly, we have to continue to, to do what, what we can to try and stop the spread of the disease. And hopefully, hopefully very soon, there will be a vaccine. But I'm really worried about the economic impact of this and the fact that the right wing will always scapegoat migrants. And we know this, they've been doing it for ages. And we, you know, we are heading for uncharted waters when it comes to the effect on the economy. The, the British economy contracted by over 20%. That's the biggest contraction in its in history. And that will be the same across the industrialized world. Never mind what's happening in, the, in countries that already had very fragile economies, which will push people to want to move somewhere else. In, in search of jobs. And, and of course, you know, we, we already had a toxic atmosphere in Britain. The Brexit referendum became a referendum on xenophobia and racism. So this, you know, when you add all this to the mix, I am extremely worried what the hard right, the extreme right, the, the fringe right, whatever you want to call them, what these people are going to make of this and, and what they're going to be starting, you know, the narrative. And, and of course, one of the things we saw at the start of, of this pandemic, there was quite a lot of anti-Chinese xenophobia as well. Like if this disease could be blamed on, on anybody, but you know, some of those views are still prevalent. I mean, you would have seen attacks at 5G masks because they thought that somehow the 5G was propagating this because those systems had come from China. I know it sounds absolutely insane, but this did happen. This did actually happen. And I think that, you know, the, the few, that the all right is going to have is that we're going to have, be in a very difficult, very difficult recession, and they will always, always look for scapegoats. So my view is that we need to redouble our efforts as a trade union movement, but also 
as a progressive movement with all the organizations that are here to, today and beyond, bringing migrants, migrants together with indigenous workers to make sure that we fight the fascists in the way that we've always done before, by standing shoulder to shoulder. We have beaten them before. We, I am sure we will beat them again, but I think we're gonna have a, a huge, huge challenge on our hands because I think that the, the economic crisis that is gonna follow now is gonna be of such a nature. It's gonna be so deep that I think it's gonna almost be, almost be a return back to the 1930s. And you know, there was a, a very good socialist slogan at the time, It'll be barbarism or socialism. Well, my view is that socialism needs to triumph. Thank you for giving me this platform. And I'm, I will be, unfortunately, only be able to stay with you until just after 2.30. But I hope that the rest of the event goes really well. And I'm really sorry, I cannot, I cannot stay to actively participate with some of the people who've been listening to this, some of the people who are online, because that's usually what I like most of meetings like this. But over back to you, Chair. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Manuel. Uh, that was a really, really good um, and sort of encouraging talk about uh, what we can do uh, moving forward. So uh, I'm just going to pass it over now to Margaret Osage. She is a member of the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union, um, which is the only independent trade union operating within the food industry and has been representing uh, working people since 1847. Uh, so they're proud of what they've achieved over the last few years and continue to lead the way in terms of fighting for a better deal uh, for members that formed the union. Uh, so over to you, Margaret. If you just unmute your, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for giving. Oh, you've muted again. Yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, my name is Margaret. Um, I'm originally from Nigeria. I'm a fast food worker at KFC in Bristol, London. And I'm a mother of two. Yeah. Uh, I came to the United Kingdom 15 years ago to make a better life for myself, as, or as we would say in Africa, for a greener pasture. But I am still more fortunate than other migrants, and I am more fortunate than those who are risking their life in search for a better life. Yet it has not been an easy experience. I am still trying to fit in daily life. What do I mean with this? Many does not see me as a mother, a sister, a friend, or a partner. They just see me as a mother, as a as another fast food worker, another migrant who should be grateful to live in England. Like many of my colleagues, I started working in fast food um, to survive because it was one of the first jobs I could find. I took it with both hands because I do not want to rely on social system. Trust me, migrant does not want to rely on social system. I started working in fast food to pay my rent, electricity, and provide for my family. Working on a zero hour contract allow me to take care of my children. It allows me to do what most mothers do. Take my children to school, attend their school meetings, support events, helping them with their homework, and just to spend time with them too. But on a poverty wage and bad scheduling, this is very difficult. As migrants, we face many challenges in work and outside of work. For example, in a workplace, when a drunk and impotent, uh, impatient um, customers hear that you have an asset, and the moment you have to ask, ask them or take the order twice just because of the noise in the store, or when you ask them to wear a mask because of COVID, Migrants, we have to hear, who are you to tell me what to do? I often have... Margaret, you've gone on mute again. Hello, you hear me? Yes, yes. I suppose that coming is just, yeah. I often hear, go back to Africa. So 
when I tell them, please don't be rude or disrespectful. So they don't want to listen or they don't want to hear that. So we, as migrants, we face this kind of discrimination and racism daily. Outside of work also, we face challenges with authorities like immigration, for example. It is very expensive to change your status due to the home office fee. Many migrant workers are on minimum wage, cannot afford, cannot afford the fees. Although we work for a rich companies like McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, Waterspoon, this causes a lot of depression for people. So what about the single mothers? Migrant worker does not have lawyers and organization to back us up. And because we are not organizing a union, it is difficult to speak out. It excludes us from society in many ways. Many of us work in a low paid job. We are exposed to racism in and out of the workplace. Yes, migrant and fast food workers is generally stigmatized. I miss my family. I miss friends. I miss hearing comforting words. I miss people who understand me. I miss being seen as human beings. Due to the pandemic and lack of support, it is difficult to spend time with family and friends. I cannot talk to anyone in times of struggle. When it comes to child care, I have little to no support from family and friends. In my case, we need to pay for all this kind of support. And as a low wage fast food worker, I cannot afford it. I cannot afford to travel to my own country, Nigeria, to see my family and friends, even though I'm working for a multi-billion dollar brand, but yet we are good enough to generate billion in profits. But why are migrants not good enough to earn a living wage? We are exploited in the foreign countries where we live and work, and companies from these countries exploit us in our own countries as well. Due to this pandemic, it, took, it looks like things might get worse. I am going, I am asking myself, what life will my children have in the future? Our children are not excluded from discrimination. Children of migrants does not get the support they need in school. When our children are struggling in school, migrant parents are immediately told by teachers, your children are a problem without being offered any kind of support. I am not taking this anymore. I am speaking out, but many of my colleagues and friends cannot speak out because of being scared to lose their job. And because English is not their first language, yet it does not mean that they don't understand and they don't have feelings. I told myself when the lockdown started, this has to stop. We add value to this economy and to this country. And what do we get for it? Poverty wage, exclusion, racist abuse. Why? That is why I joined the union. That is why I got involved in the mass strike campaign. It is good to be even, it is going to be even harder. Yeah. If we allow things to get worse, if people are going to lose their job, get low benefits, migrants will be the first to be blamed. We as migrants and non-migrants need to stand together. We are going through the same problems, regardless of our skin color or where we come from. Let us not allow the rich companies to play us out, to, out against each other. We have more in common than we think. We have the same unsafe working condition we all suffer from low pay. It has to stop. That is why I am on this call today, to tell all my colleagues in fast food and in low wage, we need to stand together, support Migrant United, join Max Strike Campaign, join our Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union. Let's get organized to try and change things. Let us stand together, let's fight for union recognition and 15 pounds per hour will be better. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to my story. 
Thank you so much, Margaret. That was um, that was a really good talk, and it's really good to have the perspective of a frontline worker um, in the in the midst of this pandemic. Um, so we're just going to quickly open up to some questions um, before Manuel and Margaret have to go. So um, if anyone has any questions, oh, I think there's one in the chat. Um, okay, so got one here from Hannah. Um, so she says, thanks for your comments, Margaret and Manuel. How can we support trade unions, particularly those who have large migrant members? Uh, and let's start with Manuel. Well, I mean, clearly, the best thing you can do to support a union is to get people who are not in a union to join a union. That's the best thing you can do. But in terms of practical solidarity, if any of the unions are engaged in any struggle, is to come along and stand with our members on the picket line. You know, we, we sadly, during the, the pandemic, we've lost some members to this terrible disease. One of them was actually working in Victoria Station, and you would, would have seen it because it got a lot of uh, media coverage, barely. One of our members at, at Victoria Station lost a life. So one of the things we did, and actually worked quite well, we, together with the family, we, we ran a petition. The petition got well over a million signatories to it. And we used that to build pressure within the, the public transport industry and the, and the rail industry in particular, to ensure that our Bain community is better looked after, because we understand now from all the evidence that is emerging that somebody in, in our Bain community who does get COVID-19 is more likely to be worse affected than somebody else. So we need to take precautionary measures and make sure that th that is included in any risk assessment that, that are undertaken. You know, I, I talked earlier about the, the right clearly is going to use the economic crisis as a way to attack migrants and migration. But I've just seen that in Switzerland today, people have voted massively to reject the ending of freedom of movement. I know freedom of movement only covers a small number of migrants and, and it's from people from European countries, but I think that that's a step forward and a victory against those who are spreading xenophobia and racism. Great, thank you Manuel. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good news to wake up to today um, that they rejected to end freedom of movement. Uh, so Margaret, do you have anything to, to add to that question? Um, not really, like uh, Amanda say, is to uh, support and join the union campaign. So we all come together to make our voice to be heard and make things happen for us. So the better we make this happen, the better for us. Hello. That's great. Uh, I think Liliana, any other Hello. Hello, Bia. Sorry to interrupt. Hello. Hi. Sorry, something happened. Um, can you hear me, Bia? Yes. Yes, I can. I have I have no button of raising my hand, but the, can people have the button to raise their hands? Can we have like short interventions, sh short questions before they have to leave, or or is it not possible? Um, I think, I think it's possible, yeah. Um, I did I you want to ask? I just wanted to ask. Oh. There's a hand on. I cannot raise my hand, that's my problem. You're muting yourself, Francisco. I, I'm just saying that because I'm one of the hosts in Zoom, I, I don't have a button to raise my hand, that's my problem. I, and I think oh, right. I'll hold on heavy, that's, that's why I'm interrupting without raising my hand. So I'll do it physically when I want to, but Alvaro has a hand up, so maybe over to him and then also I'll raise my hand if I have a chance. Uh, my, my question uh, is primarily uh, about the fact that one of the problems, I, I've had a long experience back in the 1980s of trade union organizing of migrant workers. And one of the problems that existed quite often is the, has been the reluctance of official trade unions 
to deal with undocumented migrants, which creates divisions. And uh, this has been a, a, a real problem in, uh, and, and has uh, exacerbated relationships. Often migrants argue that in order not to have divisions between documented and undocumented uh, uh, workers, it's best to organ try to organize separate from the official trade union movement. I wonder what uh, Manuel and Margaret have to say about that. That's a great question, Alvaro. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna... Can I just add one thing? If I can? Yeah, go on. I just wanted to add a little something else in terms of... Uh, because the documented and undocumented is one division, but I, I think that there's more divisions, especially now at, in Brexit times, in terms of different uh, statues, statutes, different conditions that workers have. So some workers can claim benefits, others don't. So I guess that if you cannot claim benefits or if you're more precarious or if, or if you're staying the country is at risk, you're more, you're, it's more difficult to get you to join a struggle, join a strike, for example, I can imagine. I don't know. I'm just asking what are these are well, the experiences, what are the challenges at the moment, just to add to, to Albert's question. Yeah, I think that's really uh, an important point. And I know sometimes when there's big demos, before COVID at least, um, there are a lot of people who are scared of going um, in fear of being caught and deported. Um, so that's definitely an issue that comes up. So can we start with Margaret this time? Um, do you have... Yeah, we want to understand most migrants, some of them can, like what the guy said, can claim benefit. Um, some of them got the right to work. They have no recourse to public funds. When they say no recourse to public funds, that means you don't have the right to claim any benefit, any social benefit from the, from the system. But you are working like people with no recourse to public funds. You are a single parent and you are working with kids. So it's really difficult for these kind of people to fit in into the system. So that's, that's a really big challenge for most migrants. So they can claim any benefit, any social benefit, and they have to work to survive with the kids and themselves and pay their bills. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and I think that's yeah, definitely a challenge we need to think about. Uh, Manuel, I know you have to leave soon, so I'm just going to let you yeah, go on. Chair, yeah, this will be my final contribution. But, you know, I used to be a union organiser before I became a, a, the union's general secretary. I'm still an organiser, I hope. But, you know, I've never been in a workplace and asked anybody for a passport or what the resident status is or anything like that. When I go into a workplace, my job is to have an efficient union organisation. And that means that every worker is a member and every member should become an organiser for the union in the workplace. So uh, for me, this is not an issue. I will go into any workplace. I'm trying to organize the workers. I don't care what the status is. As far as I'm concerned, they're working. And if they're working, they're eligible to join my union and nothing beyond that. I think somebody raised the point whether or not, you know, the change of status from Brexit, for example, where people will have uh, different conditions on how they can work on a work. I, I actually made a speech to TUC about this because clearly I was completely against Brexit, not because I think that the European Union is a socialist panacea, far from it, but I was completely against Brexit because I understood very early on that this was the agenda of the all right. It was, it was all about xenophobia. It was also about racism, but I also thought that the bosses would benefit from this because if you've got workers who are dependent on a work visa to come to Britain, those workers, if they lose their jobs, they're going to be kicked out. They're very unlikely to join a union and or stand up for their rights, because if they do, they will be thrown out of our country. So I saw this as a full frontal attack on workers' rights. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm sorry that I'm Thank you so me. much, Manuel. Uh, thank you for, for your time and for your contribution. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can organize together um, in the future. Yes, I hope um, so. Yep. so, shall I move on to um, Sarah's talk? Yeah. 
Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Sarah Scuzzarella. Uh, she has a PhD at Lund University and is a research fellow in cross-national comparative polit politics at the Sussex Centre for Migration Research and a lecturer at the Department of Geography. Over the last decade, Sarah has established a research programme focused on how state institutional and policy approaches to migration and integration shape migrants' identification processes and life chances, often working within a cross-national comparative framework. Uh, I was also taught by Sarah from my master's, so I have that uh, personal experience with her. So it's nice to see you again, Sarah, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Bear, and, uh, and I'm really humbled by, you know, by the opportunity of being here and, and, uh, and sharing the platform with, with so many, um, you know, really good panelists who've been listening and learning, taking notes for, um, you know, for future uh, events. Um, so I have 10, min 10 minutes, so I don't want to reiterate some of the points that Bea had done before, Manuel and, and Margaret had done before, but I just want to bring you to your attention the fact that the, the migrants, uh, and focusing on Europe, obviously concentrating in low-skilled sectors. And those are sectors that have been uh, most hit by the crisis. So it's agriculture, domestic and care work, public health care at all levels, food industry, construction, tourism, transport. Um, and those are sectors where socially distancing workers and isolating those with symptoms when accommodation is shared on site are you know, obviously big challenges. Um, we're also in a situation which in which governments throughout Europe need to fill labour gaps in low skill sectors. And we've seen examples of that when um, here in the UK, um, the government decided to fly, to fly in seasonal agricultural workers from East Europe um, during the, in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. What we've seen, um, I think, during the pandemic is there's been a shift in framing from uh, low skilled workers and quite often undesirable to key workers and heroes. And it has been, obviously we've seen all kind of national expressions of gratitude for some, however, I want to emphasize, for some workers. Um, and the reason why I'm saying, I'm emphasizing some, is that because despite symbolic gestures, um, these, these gestures, the, rather the symbolic gestures became rather hollow, um, as pointed out by many people working in the, in the health sector. And they became hollow, I think, partly because those, you know, whilst you had some people portrayed as heroes and made it exempt of taxation to uh, access public health, for instance. Many, many other migrants working in low skilled sector remain largely invisible, yet working to make the, the machinery of, of European societies function, as Bea was, was saying before, in the transport sector, the agriculture sector, the food manufacturing industry, the delivery sectors. But also these became hollow actions of, or, or hollow gestures because all these people that we were clapping are still kept in precarious or low employ or low paid employment. And then in a way to me rises the question about how European societies at large and governments in particular value migrant bodies and their contributions to society. It was a point that Margaret raised really, really well. Um, and while migrant workers, um, working in low-skilled um, employment sector, have always been in a situation of, of precarity, particularly in documented migrants. I think COVID exacerbated the situation because they suffer from problems that are uh, related to the working and employment conditions. Obviously, we're talking about zero-hour contracts and therefore they lack access to sick pay or unemployment or social benefits. Um, and because for people who are not um, European migrants, because their permit of stay is linked to employment, if they've been made redundant, the access to public health care, housing, their resident work permits are all jeopardized. So what we've seen in the last few months is how migrants are effectively putting their life at risk for the sake of all of us. Um, but we kind of forgotten all that. But what I want to bring to attention or to attention to this, to this panel are two things. One is the, the gendered effects on the pandemic. So they, we know that there is uh, that the pandemic have had um, a particularly tough effect on, on women, so to speak. Uh, we know that we have a gender pay gap, and we know that women tend to work disproportionately in more precarious, insecure, and informal employments and receive lower pay. So what the pandemic has done is both to amplify 
is going to gender dynamics, but also create new um, outcomes that impact women disproportionately. So on the one hand, we see migrant women that are highly represented among medical and low wage service providers, so the nurses, the care staff, the, and so on and so forth. And they, and it's been largely their labor that has kept and still keeps the global health and social care system running. Uh, and they have been at the front line, front line during the crisis working with sick patients. Um, but also looking at women working in the informal sector, um, the, uh, what we've seen from, for instance, female domestic workers, they've seen the work either disappear overnight as the customer refused to pay them uh, or largely stopped to pay them. <clears throat> or if they were living in, um, like living maids, for instance, and we have testimonies of people, of people losing not only their job, but they lost their accommodation, or on the other end of the spectrum, of being locked inside uh, their household for which they were working, uh, and therefore being unable to meet their social support network, which is obviously of, of great importance, particularly during um, such terrible times as, as COVID has presented us with. On top of that, women have also um, being faced with increased care and responsibilities. I think Margaret was mentioning how you know, educating her children and trying to, um, to keep up with, with the schooling. And we know that those type of responsibilities have largely fallen on women. Another thing that I think is quite important when we talk about migration, labor and, and COVID is the emotional impact that COVID has had on migrants. And I've, when I was thinking of it, I've thought about particularly four um, emotions, so to speak. One is fear, particularly for um, undocumented migrants, because they don't, we have, um, have several instances where we've seen that people don't dare to approach um, the health professionals if they have COVID related symptoms because of the fear of being, um, you know, being subject to immigration checks and fees. The second one is about uh, isolation. Um, isolation, so the lockdown has put an immense pressure on people whose social network might be limited because of the lack of knowledge of the language or not knowing many people. And this can lead to, to very severe anxiety and, and depression, especially when that is linked to precarious work conditions and, and lose of, of the risk of losing um, resident permits and uh, being deported. The third um, emotional aspect of COVID has been um, the emotional toll linked to knowing that one's family and their loved ones may be living in a country where COVID has been particularly deadly. And this emotion is told, is felt obviously by non-migrants as well, but migrants have been unable to travel back, as Bea was saying before, and support their family. And that's put an additional stress on them. And finally, throughout COVID-19, um, through this crisis, many migrants, particularly those from East Asian backgrounds, are reporting more experiences of racism and xenophobia. Uh, and they've become associated with, with the virus. And there's been an increased number of people of Asian outlook reporting being physically and verbally attacked. So where does this leave us, so to speak? Um, so COVID has become obviously the most important crisis that Western countries have faced, probably since the, the Second World War. And I think we are at the breaking point, right? So we are at an historical moment where the world as we know has been disrupted. And although I see what Manuel is saying, um, that you know we can go down the path of, um, you know, follow the, the recent trends, become more exacerbated um, and let the pandemic fuel, oh, fuel fear, fuel racism, fuel exclusions of the most vulnerable. I think also we have a choice because also we can also see, we can, we can also draw lessons from the pandemic, reminding ourselves how we have clapped the NHS work, the workers, how in some countries, like for instance in Italy, there's been um, amnesties to, to um, let people, undocumented migrants, stay in the country. And we have seen that how much society actually rely on migrants uh, and that low-skilled workers are actually key workers. So without being too naive, obviously we have uh, a looming American elections that does not make me very positive um, in terms of, of geopolitical um, affairs or international affairs. I think that there is, we have a chance here, we have an opportunity here and we should chase the opportunity. I think that there's been for too long a silent majority that has been too silent and it's time for that silent majority to actually be vocal. Um, so 
yes, let's support the trade unions, let's support the workers, but the burden should not be, or the burden of responsibility should, could not be or cannot be only on the workers. Uh, it has a much bigger, um, it requires much bigger support. Okay, I'll stop there now. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was um, a really good and comprehensive talk. And um, I really enjoyed the sort of message of hope at the end. And I definitely agree with it. I think anyone who has a voice um, should speak out um, right now. And it's a really important time. Um, so I'm going to be moving on to our final speaker, um, Don Flynn, who is the former director of Migrants Rights Network. Uh, a network of civil society organizations working to support the rights of migrants. He also helped found uh, Migrants Rights Network after 30 years work on migration issues and law centers and as a policy offer, officer sorry, at the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants and an immigration caseworker in London. He also chairs the UK Race and Equality Network and the Platform for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm going to open it up for Don. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thanks, B. I think I'm turned on. Can you, you can hear me? Okay. Um, th thanks for that introduction. Um, you, you said former uh, quite a lot there, and it's only that I'm no longer in a paid capacity because I I hit retirement age a couple of years ago, but I am still very very active in there. Uh, quite a lot of activities in support of uh, migrant rights, in fact, possibly some ways more now than ever. Um, and thanks a lot to Migrant United for organising this event today. It was really welcome to see that uh, some that there are people who are keen to be looking at the bigger picture, what exactly is going to be the shape of migration and mo mobility in the future, and trying to uh, pick out a path for ourselves, a way that we can see ourselves through the, the dangers which are looming in the future. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that there's a, a, you know, a lot of people are talking about the current crisis as being unprecedented and of course the sheer magnitude and the speed of it, that's probably true. Um, but there have been other turning points which are some way comparable to where we're going through at the moment and where there was a, immigration had a very significant role st or story to tell within that. And I think if we look at that, we might begin to get some sense of the issues that are likely to be cropping up for us. And I'm thinking in particular of a situation in the 1970s, um, which was a decade of transition from one old economy, what was called the Fordist economy, the mass empl industrial employment economy, uh, which generated labour migration of a particular type, um, people coming to work in, it's across Europe, it was primarily in the guest worker um, uh, systems of one sort or another. Um, but that was the, the 1970s was a period of a major structural crisis within Western capitalism, uh, which was associated with the energy crisis, the oil crisis. Um, and it produced um, the, the, the pivotal year of 1973, which was a year of what in Germany was called the migration stop. Basically, labour migration came to an end. Um, as, as corporations, as industrial capitalism began to downsize, to, uh, to shake out its need for workers, not only to downsize, but to outsource as well, uh, to establish production, uh, production abroad. Um, and, no, and nominally, immigration came to an end uh, in this period. In fact, it didn't. Uh, the shape of migration was actually transformed. It ceased to be uh, labor migration as a primary form of migration and instead you've got family reunification, actually expanded uh, migrations from, 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 from that time onwards. But the key thing about it was that by the end of what process was uh, finished, there was a completely different form of capitalism in the West that come, in, come into existence. Uh, European countries were no longer industrial countries, they were now post-industrial countries, and the vast majority of people who were in employment were working in the service sector. About eight in the UK, around about 80% of workers are in the service sector. Um, and uh, migrants have continued to play a absolutely critical role within this, uh, within this service sector. In fact, in some ways, they are structurally more important to the service sector uh, than, they, than they were even in the old industrial 
uh, econo uh, economies. Um, and we can see that in a, in a number of areas, areas like passenger transport, where migrants uh, make up something like 30% of the workforce, uh, combination and food production, 28%, uh, um, retail, pharmaceuticals, 17%, um, uh, uh, personal care, 16%. Um, but aside from these figures, we've also, there's also an important conglomeration effect. It's not that these 16% and 18% and whatever evenly spread across the country. There is a huge concentration of these migrant labour forces in the parts of the economy which are most productive. And over the space of the last couple of decades or so, economic growth in a country like the UK has been driven by London and the southeast areas where migrants uh, are, are, are working in, in far bigger proportions. So the importance of this um, is that uh, it helps us to understand that migration has not been a peripheral event in the history of, of society in recent years where, where migrants doing little bits of jobs here and there on the outskirts of, of productive industries. They have been absolutely critical to the shape and the form of, a, of, the, of the industrial society, the post-industrial society that's come, in, uh, come into existence. Now this poses, this structural importance of migration to capital um, poses some real uh, issues, I think, for the way things are going. Um, because the sectors that we've been talking about, all the ones I've just listed, have also been the ones which have been most badly hit by the recession. We think what's happened to transport, uh, to the retail industry, hospitality industries, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's likely that there's going to be that they are not going to recover in their present form. If they're going to recover at all, we have to presume it'll be on a completely different basis. Um, and the issue there is whether um, migrants are going to continue to play a role in the for in the in 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 in, in, the, in the in the recovery that's, that emerges from that. Um, and it's clearly the intention pre-COVID crisis. It was the intention of the the government um, that they wouldn't be playing that role. Um, and this was the whole idea of the post-Brexit uh, uh, points-based migration policy. Um, was it, it was seen as a mechanism which would be shaking migrants out of the key the sectors where they had become, become key. Um, and it would a, a process would be underway in which native-born workers could be encouraged to take their, 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 their positions. Um, and uh, this is this has resulted in uh, the immigration bills which are going through Parliament at the moment and the, the attempt to reconsider immigration on a completely different form. Uh, is it, it's clearly not going to happen on that basis anymore um, because the government is simply having to ad ad accomplish two, so many things at once and in such rapid time. Um, it's not just a question of uh, over time bringing British workers in to do the jobs that migrant work workers were de dealing with. Um, it's also a question of organising the recovery of those sectors as well. And that is going to mean uh, making use of the skills that migrant workers have got at the moment. Um, many of these are soft skills um, that, that, have, that have emerged because they've been working there over the space of, of decades. Um, the fact that they have managed to make flexibility work for them in some shape or form. I think as Margaret was mentioning, her work in the fast food industry suited her because it was something that she could, she could leverage to her presumably partial advantage. Now migrants have learned how to do, do these things, it's part of it. Um, it is very unlikely that the government is going to be able to find a willing and able labour force amongst na the native British workers who are very easily going to be able to make that transition. And it's for that reason, I think I'm probably, I, I think it's, we, we really ought to be anticipating that the government is going to have to continue to make use of migration in some volume in order to ensure the survival, the continuity of these important sectors of the economy. Um, which if they don't survive, then we're really in danger of precipitating a, a major collapse and the possibility of a recession that will be going on for years. 
uh, this to my mind actually maps out at the possibility of leverage on our part um, and if only we can get our act together and take advantage of the opportunities that might come from this um, then we don't have to be so pessimistic we don't have to think in terms of yet more setbacks um, more uh, more loss of rights and uh, and so on um, and I think that this is possible um, even spontaneously in the early stages of the lockdown we saw that workers in the in the NHS migrant workers in the NHS were able to uh, mount a counter-offensive um, against efforts to get them to pay international health charges things of that nature these were partial victories but they found a willing audience out amongst the general public that said it was ridiculous that these people who were being applauded as Sarah was saying these people were being applauded should be expected to pay this penalty now, that is the shape of the argument that has to be dealt, developed in the future it has to be what do we need to do the migrant workers have proven their worth their value their centrality to the service economy which now prevails across the UK what needs to happen in order to make sure to maintain ensure that they remain productive they remain uh, that the jobs that they're doing are decent work they, they have leverage within the system so that they can turn it to their advantage again the way that Margaret was talking about working within the the, the fast food industries basically this is an agenda about empowerment how do we look critically at what the structure of employment look, is, is at the moment and where, where, where is the leverage that we're likely to be having in that system to, uh, to bring about changes. Uh, the first thing to do there is to look at the role that the trade unions are playing. Are they sufficiently up to the task at the moment? And the Baker's Union is very welcome he, 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 hearing the account that's been given there. Some of the public sector unions as well. But I think as other people have hinted, uh, there is the innovation, the initiatives that have been taking place in the new independent unions, the independent workers of Great Britain, United Voices of the World, which have been very finely attuned to the needs of, 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 of migrants and, and promoting their work. We need more of that. We need a process which allows us to learn what is going, going on there. Um, bringing my these op opening comments to a conclusion, I mean that we need a clear program of what we, we should be pushing for within that. Um, I think foremost amongst those is a need, need for a wage increase, uh, £15 an hour uh, for key workers. That is a key test of whether it was worth, worth standing out and applauding during those months. And that's right the way across the board. That extends to workers in retail workers in personal care, workers in transport, a £15 an hour um, uh, waging, wage increase ought to be there. We also ought to be demanding that the social security system, which as other people have pointed out, currently excludes migrant workers. Anybody who has got any form of conditions attached to their immigration status has no recourse to public funds. And for whole groups of people, particularly women workers with, with childcare responsibilities, this is a major penalty. This publishes, this pushes tens of thousands of people beyond the, the poverty line. We ought to be demanding a reform of the social security system, which it provides comprehensive cover for every, uh, everybody. And um, my very final point here, um, is that a lot of issues that, are, that we're concerned about here, the, the service sector, the insecurity, the, the non-standard short-term contracts and so on and so forth, they don't only cover migrant workers. Migrants are a critical component part of those workforces, but they're not the, the, the only part. They are, are working alongside native-born British workers. Um, and in my view, the task of is not only migrants uniting, it is migrants' leadership. It is a cohort of people who have lived through the worst of these years, actually being able to map out a, a route forward, not just for themselves, but for all workers who are going to be facing the, the crisis of the common period. So I think these are some of the tasks that we've got to face up to. 
That was great. Thank you so much, Don. Um, that was a really good talk and it was really nice to have this sort of historical context behind a, a former crisis as well. Um, so I'm just going to get stuck in with some questions that have been raised. Uh, I'm going to read out um, three questions and then um, I'll pass it over to Sarah and then Don to, um, to answer how they see fit. So we, we've got a question from José Luis Hatton. He says, um, can you say something about the different impacts of pandemics on migrants' lives, especially security and work? in the parts of UK far from London. Uh, I'm just going to read the next question on, which is from Owen S. Espley. Um, the question is, with the exception of this excellent event, thanks Owen, uh, do migrant rights groups focus enough on work and do labour groups, including trade unions, focus on migrants enough? What could both groups do better? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, that I'm really interested to hear the answers to. Um, and the last question I'll read out, by the way, anyone feel free um, to put your hand up um, or raise any questions in the chat and we'll get to them um, eventually. Um, so the last one's from David Fidel um, and he says, I would be very interested to hear from anyone regarding the potential negative impact specifically on asylum seekers and refugees especially regarding tightening of borders and controls and also potentially making it much more difficult to obtain asylum. Using fears related to COVID as an excuse for rejecting asylum claims and providing protection uh, for refugees. So yeah, I think those are really good questions. Um, I sort of just want to add my own point to that because um, something that's been um, concerning me lately is how much the both political parties, shamefully Labour, have not been um, opposing the um, bill that would basically allow the British government to torture um, already survivors of torture or um, refugees and migrants. Um, so I would really like to hear um, any responses from both of you. So we'll start with Sarah. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to process a form of, of, of answer that. Um, so uh, let me let me just start with, um, I think it was Owen, yeah, um, talking about, you know, whether groups should do better. And I would like to start by asking for more imagination. So, you know, what, not whether migrant rights work, um, migrant rights group focus on work and labor rights group focus on that front or migrants enough, but I think we need to start expanding the idea of what work constitutes in that because there's a tendency to focus solely on paid work. Um, and what concerns me in that is that a large number of migrants, particularly female migrants, are not, you know, very easily kind of fall uh, between the cracks in that conversation about um, being protected by law. Um, and being, you know, being, being included in society. So I think, first of all, we might want to start broadening that what we mean by, by work to include care work and unpaid and reproductive labour. Um, whether we need more communication, yes. Uh, of course, we you know communication is what is good. But I think Alvaro was, was mentioning it at, um, at the beginning of this, of this meeting. Um, there's also, also been some tensions between trade unions and migrant um, and migrant groups, uh, so perhaps rather than seeing, you know, there is there's almost a degree of, of uh, desire to protect uh, our own turf, so to speak. And I think what we need to do more is to to, to bond alliances between um, between the two. So I don't know if you kind of probably more. Um, Make it the 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 that is directly that doesn't directly answer the question or um, at least I hope it kind of opens for for a broader dialogue rather. Um, and then to David's question about um, the potential negative impacts on asylum seeking refugees. So I think we have a number of things. I don't think the COVID necessarily can be used as an excuse to reject asylum claims. So at least I don't I don't fully see it. So perhaps David David wants to. To jump in and, and and help me out how how you see that 
What we can see, however, is that we've been seeing um, a limitation in the movement of people, right? So obviously the, the, the uh, restrictions in terms of whether we can fly or not and so on and so forth. And that has had an impact on the routes taken by migrants or by asylum seekers, sorry, um, and migrants, generally speaking. So all the, the, the fuss in a way about um, dingus crossing the channel is nothing more than a reflection. Not, it's, you know, it's nothing um, in terms of, of invasion as Priti Patel wanted to, to frame it as, is nothing more than a reflection of the change of means that migrants are able to used across the border and the channel. So what we see is rather is um, an adaptation of migrants in the routes that they choose and the means that they use to uh, arrive at the destination that they desire. Um, that said, you know, the, the, the new European um, deal on migration doesn't exactly vote for, you know, it's not, it doesn't exactly look very hopeful in, in terms of um, how we're going to see migrants. Uh, and whether you're going to see them as part of society and as, as contributors to society. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stay there. That's great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to pass it on to Don. Uh, any sort of thoughts or responses to any of those questions? Or all? Sure. Um, yeah, on the, the first question on the differential um, impact of, of the, of the uh, coronavirus on on migrants I mean these these are fairly clear and they that, that so much of these this differential impact actually arises because of the disadvantaged position of migrants as, as uh, in the labor force um, the fact that they are um, low paid um, the fact that they um, have that they uh, that they were expected to work on a highly flexible basis but I think perhaps most crucially uh, for so many of them they had no uh, right to the social welfare support um, that was that's available to other people who were um, who were being uh, supported even in, in unemployment being able to claim universal credit on the enhanced terms that, that the government was offering um, a higher proportion of migrant workers have got so-called self-employed contracts um, which also excluded them from um, the the additional the furlough support and the, the the other the other support that was going and the net effect of all of this um, was that they were continuing to have to work far more than anybody else um, and um, they and and they care the risks uh, for doing that um, and uh, some of the some of the the the, the domestic the, the outside work factors. And the standard of accommodation that they were in, the fact that they were likely to be living in multi-generational um, households, um, meant meant that the, the the impact of the virus has ripped across micro communities, black and minority ethnic communities, and we we know uh, what some of the evidence of, of, of that is. Um, in terms of out of London, um, there's a, a report that came out only during the course of a week, looking at migrant workers. Um, in the um, in the agricultural sector in the Fenland um, region of, of East London, um, where um, you know people living on in caravans basically on the farms that uh, employ them, uh, where coronavirus has been uh, present within those within within those communities, um, and very few of the advantages of being able to uh, get the support that was needed to um, for, for them. Um, on uh, Owen's point about do migrant rights groups um, emphasise enough? I, no, I, they certainly don't, Owen. I think we've had this conversation and they, I think you know my views on this. Um, the, um, you know, the, the bottom line is that the, 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 the bulk of migration that takes place across the world takes place for, for employment reasons. That is the initial motivation that people um, cross borders um, in order to look for uh, opp work opportunities. What follows on from that is family reunification, the fact that people want to live together as families, and then uh, asylum, uh, refugee migration is, is a third component of it. But the bulk of it is, is work-related uh, migration. And really to understand um, the issues that confront migrant communities, you really do have to look at the, at the world of work. 
um, and um, I think also in order to look for strategies for improving people's conditions it means looking at the leverage that might be available to migrants within the world of work um, and we're used to thinking in very orthodox terms about membership of trade unions and things of this nature um, and I think we have to extend it be beyond that we need strategies um, that look at the way in which migrants transform sectors which they are nominally vulnerable um, they actually they manage to make them work uh, for them in, in, in various ways and I mean again I've referred several times to the fast food sector because Margaret uh, men men mentioned, that, mentioned that before um, but over my the years that I've observed this I've always taken into been surprised by the extent to which low-wage uh, jobs um, because migrants have networks that have been supporting one another for example being able to share family family care responsibilities and, and whatever on a communal basis and um, it this this employment has become viable to them whereas much more atomized native british workers have floundered uh, from it and that possibly adds a bit of emphasis to uh, or underscores sarah's point about the need to actually understand the social context the social context in which people in which work becomes viable paid work becomes viable and very often that does re and particularly for women workers that requires all the ancillary factors of child care um, or, or care right the way across the board and that needs to be looked at integrated and built into our strategy for empowerment um, and finally on david's um point um, Yes, I mean, I think asylum seekers have, have not only refugees have not only been the big victims of, of the uh, coronavirus crisis because of the closing of borders, but in fact that they have been the uh, big victims for the last 20, 25 odd years of the evolution of immigration policy, which so much of it is, has been directed about how do we close down the rights that were nominally available to them because of the 1951 Refu uh, refugee convention and you know governments in the west have uh, have looked at the the ways in which th that convention has worked for migrant work uh, for refugees over the years and they've looked for the different ways to close off um, uh, that those mechanisms that's going to continue i think you know the, the, the um, i think it was sarah's reference to the uh, european um uh, compact that's underway at the moment, which is a, a, a version of a global compact. Um, and the key factor about that for both the global compact and the European compact is that they are out to gut the system of rights. That is if notionally back in the 1950s and other periods of time, there was a notion that, that, that were rights were attached to migration. So much as that's been happening since then is how do we evacuate rights from the system how do we make the movement of people across borders completely contingent on whatever rules and regulations are thrown up um, by, by, uh, by governments? Um, so in that sense, refugees and economic migrants, labour migrants, have a, a, a common issue to address, which is how do we get rights back into the system? Can I thank you so much, Don? That was a really sorry. Go on, Sarah. Yeah. No, I just wanted uh, was wondering if I could follow up onto what Don was was just saying on the issue of leverage. Um, is that okay, or am I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of still not used to this all zooming interaction thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just you know, I think you know, I agree with you, Don. I mean, the, the idea of, of leverage is incredibly important, but I think it needs to, you know, always. Um, I'm always. Uh, Striking by the, you know how migrants can actually mobilize and be successful in that. However, as you, you know, obviously very well know, um, quite often it's a question of the degree to which they can afford to mobilize. You know, can they afford to go on strike? Can afford, you know, not only financially but also on a, on a security viewpoint. And that's why I was talking or calling for um, more solidarity across across group. Because even the, the example that you brought forward before about the, the care worker or the health worker. 
um, mobilizing and being able to um, to, to change the, the taxes that they had to pay on, on um, accessing public health, that worked only in conjunction with a change in public opinion. Um, and I think what we need to do, especially in, now I'm talking about the UK in particular, because there might be different um, different cases in other, in other European countries, but we live in a moment in, in political history where the government is actually um, governing through press releases rather than through policy. And perhaps we need to make the most of that, however weird they might sound, and try to mobilize public opinion around these issues. Because what we're talking about is people that are crucial, you know, migrants, especially in low skill sectors, they are crucial for the economy of society, but they're highly disenfranchised and they have no, you know, they're no voters. So obviously they're not the, the main, um, there's not where my politicians are going to turn to for, uh, to get elected, so to speak. Um, so trying to um, to mobilize public opinion in that in a way that will might have an impact on government in the same way that has had for care workers. Having said that, um, people working in the care work sector only have um, a temporary exemption from paying this um, this tax. So you know, as soon as they're not framed as being key workers anymore, you know. I'll, I'll put two pounds that are going to be having to pay um, to pay for the health um, provider, so to speak. So we, we try to need to keep the momentum. There's always trying to say that there's been a, a, a minority of people working very, very hard to um, to, mob, to to support uh, migrant workers, but there's been there's a much larger majority that's been very, very quiet, and in theory supports what what um, migrant, migrant rights groups, uh, for instance, are doing, but it's not really doing enough. And supporting by sending, by clicking on, on, on Facebook, so to speak, doesn't really bring us anywhere. Um, so it, well, we need, I think what well, the key is to try to mobilize the, the silent majority to bring forward change. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with all of that. And I, um, I suspect, I mean, breaking that down into sort of bite-sized chunks, doable chunks, it would be mm. the immediate thing to do would be to fight to retain the concept of key worker. I mean, yeah. let's stop talking about low-paid workers and low-skilled workers um, altogether um, and talk about the fact that people whose, whose, whose jobs are critical in some shape or form to the, yes. um, and they, you know, they add value to, to, commu uh, to community life. Um, and then you know build upwards from that um and i you know there are you know some groups of a community have gone further than others to some that was a gesture that was made back in the days i mean i think there was i was encouraged to see that black lives matter and um, very quickly um began to combine all the elements of the police um the brutality of, of, of policing um was the, com the comparison with the brutality of the immigration control system were, were very much fused together. Um, and, you know, that, that's a permanent gain. I mean, we have to work to make sure that that is a, a permanent gain. Um, I, I think that the, the, the question, which we, we didn't really refer to in our, our roundup, but the final one that, 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 that came to us from B, which is the, the role of the political parties, um, with it within this, it does seem to me that a you know some sort of a, a project needs to be formulated, um, particularly for the centre left, um, making use of the trade unions and, and whatever, but going to the Labour Party and finding out exactly what they they, they mean um, by their new term. This, um, this this all of this talk about um, patriotism and whatever, which I think at the moment is an empty signifier. Um, a floating signifier basically it's something which has no particular content um but you know we have got a right it seems to me to to go to the labor party and say to them you know what is the content what exactly are you thinking about in these areas because we consider these to be the gains and you better not welch on them better not be turning on your back uh, your back on the the sense that exists in the population that immigration policy has to contain the element of migrants rights and and migrants justice and build on that 
Absolutely, but also part of what you were saying is kind of moving away from the idea of of highly skilled workers to be highly important for society and low skilled workers to be disposable and not and not interesting. Although um, Patel's um, rhetoric follows exactly those lines, uh, you know, she wants to to attract the brightest and the best and the brightest. That yeah, but at the same time, it's not exactly that they're creating a, an environment where the best and brightest might want to come here. Um, but also, that, as, you were, you know, as we've been talking about throughout this, this hour and a half, people with who might not have a university degree, um, so might not have a formal education, so to speak, are being pivotal to the to the existence of society. Um, much more, you know, much more than me as a, with a PhD. Um, you know, I, I'm disposable in that sense. You know, but people like uh, you know, working in the, in the food manufacturing are not. If they go we don't eat. Um, and that's probably a bigger problem. Yeah, actually, there, there has been even some sort of backhanded recognition of that on the part of the points based scheme as it's been devised. I mean, people haven't really commented on it, but one of the, the threshold for qualifications was, was lowered uh, on the recommendations of the Migrant Advisory Committee, but it was lowered from university level to what's effectively high school. Um, level qualifications, A levels, and there was very, very little comment on that. I thought, and I thought it was ironic because um, one of the effects of it is that these migrants with A level type qualifications, and there are an awful lot of them in the world mm -hmm. out there, are basically now in competition with your A level students um, in order to for entry level jobs in the labour market, uh, which is would be the reactionary interpretation of the whole thing but it did illustrate you know the the analysis of the structural issues that exist for the british economy which your mainstream economists have, 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 have clocked and that they are pressing on the politicians and we, you know we've got to pick that up and turn that to our advantage as well mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt i was really enjoying that um that sort of debate and um back and forth. But um, I think we've got um, a question from Francisco, uh, who wanted, who was raising his hand. Um, did you want to speak? Thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it was not so much of a question, but a more comment. And I, I kind of, I was, didn't want to, I wanted to hear other voices as well. Uh, but if no one has, has raised their hands, I'll, I'll go. I just, I just find it. Uh, I think one of our, um, the aims of this, of this um, debate, and I thank you very much for your interventions, Don and Sarah. They were absolutely fantastic and touched on very interesting points. And um, I think one of it's exactly what you put is like how to move from these emotions that you've, um, that that Sarah very well described, that are kind of raising amongst. Uh, migrants the fear isolation and worry right and racism as well in some ways but these are exactly the emotions that may make us uh, or retract us from intervening politically from being able to join to 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 you know it's exactly the opposite of solidarity of political intervention of courage of bravery that it's needed right so these are things that kind of go against us and and put us in this in put migrants in this in the situation of political objects rather than subjects, rather than, you know, political actors that can kind of, you know, be at, at the center of the agenda of the political discussions and do uh, what Don was saying, like, you know, demanding from the political parties that, you know, we, even though we don't have a vote, right, that we're not kind of the part of the electorate uh, market. But many migrants actually have worked, have kind of campaigned for the Labour Party this, in this election, right? Many, many migrants that, that didn't have a right to vote actually worked for the Labour Party. So there's, there's some more than the vote, but, but, I, but moving not just to that sort of intervention, but to this idea that I think is really interesting that Don raised, which is the idea of the migrant leadership, right? We have to take on the role of leaders because actually we have something to show and something to say, not just about our own condition as migrants, but about the condition of, you know, the human condition, so to speak, but, but, but in, in, this, in this case, the labor, the, the issues of labor rights, the issues of how we, of political rights. And I, I think that, you know, there's, there's, I mean, the, this, this discussion around, for example, you know, 
around um, limiting the rights of migrants being a way of protecting native workers is, is a complete, uh, you know, it, it's a nonsense. And, and we kind of, we don't, I don't think we challenge this nonsense high enough, right? Because the border control for, for migrants is not protecting native migrants. On the contrary, it's creating the, the possibility of of a workforce with a lower with the lower labor rights to be competing for the jobs for the same jobs. So can they are actually what lowers the the work conditions for everyone is the fact that we have two tiers at least or more tiers of kind of worker status, right? So there's there's a lot of arguments that we're not combating, and, and often we combat them with we fall into traps like this idea. I think this idea that you know, this argument against Brexit that is, that, that, that says that, you know, migrants have, um, my, migrants do work, do the work that the, 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 the native workers don't want to do, right? It's kind of a, it's a trap in many ways because it could be like understood as a, almost a racist argument, right? But I think Don put it really well here. It's like, it's not just, you know, we're not saying that, we're not kind of defending that. We're saying that there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of things that are kind of actually constructive in the way that migrants have to appropriate uh, and, and kind of interact with these with this, with this jobs. And these are jobs of care, right? These are mainly jobs of care. When we talk about service industry, I think when we talk about care, we talk about like looking after kids and looking after the ill, but there's a lot of work uh, you know, this work that we call service is in many ways the work of care, like the, the care with the feeding of feeding people, you know, even, even the, uh, it's, it's a shame that Manuel is not here anymore, but the, t the, 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 the workers in that, you know, work in the ticket offices in the, in the tube, right? The people say that they're not needed anymore, but they do a, a, another type of work that is care. Like we go into tube sessions, if there's only machines, there's not no one to take care of us, but there's nowhere to ask anything. There's nowhere to, no one to sort of, you know, look after the people that are there. So this work of care, it's part of the, it's a very important part of the economy. And as you say, we are kind of, uh, we kind of, um, you know, we have an opportunity to kind of at the moment where kind of, you know, we care workers are, are the sung heroes, right? We have a, a lot of opportunities here. So sorry, I'm, I'm being too long, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just throwing some ideas. I see there's no hands up, so I'm kind of carrying on. Raise your hands if you want. But what I'm saying is like, how do we move from this kind of increased fear, isolation and worry that we have and this increasing racism that makes migrants smaller and smaller and smaller into this kind of, you know, increasing need for us to be taking the political leadership, right? I know it's a question I ask for everyone. I don't know if anyone has any answers or any contributions. Can I just ask very quickly, I mean, is, is it increased? What? Marginalization or whatever. So or is it not polarization? That's, that's what seems to me. There's an argument to say that that's what's happening, that though the, the right wing pole is becoming more vicious and unpleasant and, and dangerous, um, but on the other hand, it does seem to me that there is a, another part of society which is going mm. through arriving at exactly the opposite conclusions. Um, our problem is that the right wing has got political leadership and they've got the media, the tabloid media, to back up their lines of thinking. Um, whereas we tend to be much more reliant on, you know, our own initiative in order to weave together the the, old, the alternative perspective. But it is there, um, you know, I, I mean, I started this work in working in law centers back in the 1970s. And I can tell you that the really bleak years for trying to promote the idea of migrant rights were the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, and things only began to, you, the sense that there was an audience for what you were trying to say. Um, you know, people who were prepared to work with you to develop and strengthen this case only began to emerge in the in in the noughties. And it is now as strong as it ever has been. Um, there are still critical points missing uh, from it. I mean, I, I still, it's hard to find a really authentic leaders who have lived the migrant life um, and who are confident enough to push themselves right right the way to the forefront. Um, 
but where you know that's that's the mountain that we're scaling and we have got quite some way up up its side if i can just follow on to it follow on to it. tell me if you have hand raised because i can't see them obviously um no i agree with everything mean, agree and disagree i think it the right wing is, I'm not sure why it's become more vicious. I think it's starting to become more visible and more acceptable in a way. Um, you know, it's become part of the, the political debate in a way that I would have never thought would be possible 20 years ago. Um, you know, now it's okay to say certain things today. It's okay to see certain things today that we couldn't see. But I think also we need to, um, to make some kind of self critique in a way from from the center left or however we're in the spectrum where I want to be about the lack of imagination um, and there is you know, I think that the center left in Europe um, has missed opportunities in the last 30 years to galvanize um, society and, and try to rally people around around changes um, that globalization has brought with it um, and to to in a way to spread the benefits of globalizations, where there's increased, you know, increased diversity or um, different ways of working, for instance. And in too many countries, I've seen the left sliding too easily towards um, wordings and, and, and I wouldn't say ideas, but certainly wordings and ways of phrasing, ways of framing issues that I don't feel comfortable with. So I think there's, there's a, we, we missed a chance there to do more and to be real internationalist, um, as, you know, as, as your organization wants to be. You know, I think there's that type of internationalism should be broke out, or should be put forward um, and, and championed by the leading parties um, across Europe. And in that, I think we missed the chance to, you know, maybe I'm, I'm repeating myself, but to communicate and to build bridges. Um, but I missed the chance to build bridges with migrant communities by talking uh, or rather by, by, by pretending we can sit in their shoes in a way. I think Don was you know, Don just saying we don't have enough politicians that kind of can express the life experiences of the migrants. But we talk about migrants and we talk about their experiences as if, as if we knew about it. But we don't put migrants in, the, in a position of leadership. And that is a big issue. Uh, in this, in how to, you know, to, to go back to Francisco's question, how to move migrants' position from objects to subjects, because we keep looking at migrants as objects to be treated somehow, or objects to be fixed, objects to be saved, objects to be helped. And you know, it's like, you know, I, I come from a very comfortable position of, of being, um, you know, working in a university, but I don't think you know as, as Bob Margaret put it very well. You know, migrants don't want to be helped that way. Migrants want to have ability to be and, and lead their lives. Um, and I think that is a, you know it's an important point that we don't we can never forget. Thank you so much um, for all your responses. Um, yeah, I think really important points were raised here. Um, and they're definitely the sort of challenges that we're going to be looking at in the next few months and years. Um, I would like to see more people get involved. So if anyone has a question or a comment or anything like that, I would encourage them to say something. Um, I do have a question if no one else has one um, at the moment, but please um, raise your hand or turn on your camera anyone has a question right now oh we've got a question from Rebecca um, are there any plans to invite more migrant workers onto these sorts of calls um, I guess that's a question for us as Migrant United and um, yes is the answer um, I guess there's definitely yes um, I think we're trying to um, organize and um, reach as many people um, as possible with these sorts of events and um, yeah that that tends to be sometimes where we struggle is to find um, a sort of wider group 
um, and where to reach them. So any sort of suggestions and things like that, we're very welcome to. Oh, there's another question from Rebecca. Um, what are we doing to encourage more migrant workers into positions of leadership in our own industries? I think that's a really good question. And um, it actually um, feeds into mine as well. Um, so I'm just gonna ask mine and then ask the, the panelists to respond. Um, Cause I, I sort of wanted to know, and I don't know if you, if you have an answer to this, but um, I know a lot of people having grown up in the UK, I'm a migrant, but I, have, I went to school here. So I have a lot of friends, particularly British, who work in sort of the media sector, PR, um, marketing, and all of that, um, that sort of industry. Um, and I feel like migrants are massively underrepresented in that, um, even because, you know, we talk about the key workers and there's, there are so many migrant key workers, but there are um, other migrant workers who want to and have the ability um, to be in, the, in those sectors, but uh, struggle, um, especially if they're not from European origin. Um, mm. So I, I would like to ask um, how we can sort of campaign and encourage these industries to um, include and see the value of migrants as um, Don, you said earlier that um, indispensable in the service industry, how can we make people see that they're indispens indispensable in other industries as well. Um, can we start with Don? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a quick reply to that last question, but I think you know, as far as the trade unions are concerned, it's employ a lot more um, people who have lived the migrant life as trade union organisers. Um, you know, help design a campaign for going out into the sectors uh, where migrants are, are most concentrated and provide them with the material that allows them to recruit. And I, I sat back, the American trade unions are actually very, very good about this. They, you know, if you have the opportunity to have a conversation with a, a labor organizer in the organizing janitors or uh, domestic workers or other groups in the States, they've got loads of ideas about how, how that's done, but it is all pivotal on the idea of the organizers themselves being people who have lived migration, who have done the jobs, who have worked alongside the people that they're organizing. I think doing that, but the other thing is some, is there a, any sense of a organizing strategy behind this? I mean, I, I would like to see the trade unions actually get together the TUC to have a conference on uh, the, the migrant workers fighting for the rights of migrant workers which brought together all the people who are doing the sort of work that Migrants United are, de are dealing with or people who have already got positions within the trade union movement and tell them how are we going to how are we going to move on from where we are at the moment if I mean, if we if we could do that within the next six to 12 months or so, it seems to me we would be so much stronger in terms of facing up for the future. Thank you, Don. Sarah? Um, well, to, to Rebecca um, and, and to your question. So I'm working in, in, in the higher education sector um, and I can't help to see parallels between what we're talking about um, in this conversation and then what's happening in academia. So, we, you know, we have in academia about 21,000 professors and of them, 140 identify as black and of them, 25 are women. So we have 25 female black professors in this country. Okay, that's, that's not on. Um, but I think we need, you need to learn lessons from other, um, other fights that's been fought before in many ways. I, need, I think we need to, to, to support um, people of migrant background to, to take more uh, leadership positions in whatever sector they're working in, okay? Um, we need to encourage them in that sense. We need to put mechanisms into place that, that make people visible rather than invisible. So pointing out, you know, actually we are, you're not listening to this particular person's experience. Um, we need also to sit back and to acknowledge our own privilege um, as 
natives uh, and 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 realize you know that as natives we come with a certain um, social and human capital that a migrant will not have access to but they have access to a different um, capital that can be highly beneficial to to the place of where we're working and and sorry if I, if I sound so if I pick on you Don but I just can't help you know you were you were advocating for having a conference um, you know for all the trade unions together I think it's a great idea but then you said having a conference on migrants and I think that, that is that in a way that is the issue is about having a conference with migrants or for migrants or where migrants talk to us about what they're doing and what the issues that they are facing. So it's not about doing something on migrants, but doing something with migrants as, you know, going back to Francisco's wording, as subject of that conference, not something we need to look at. You see what I mean? I think it's, it's so important to, to recognize that the, the biases that we all have um, in, the, in the best of, of, of um, um, you know, in the best will, you know, in our best ideas and trying to, to say, okay, well done, I need to take a step back. And in this fight um, about migrant um, workers' rights and equality, I need to be the soldiers led by somebody else. I can't be the general that leads the migrant to get for them to get a better life. You see what I mean? Um, I, I, I agree completely. I accept your point entirely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Bea, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I just realised. Um, yeah, so we, we did have um, a couple more questions here. Um, I thought they were um, really good answers. I don't know if um, Rebecca, you wanted to say anything in response to to the responses to your question, or um, if we should move on. I'll assume um, she's happy where she is, so I'll just um, move on. Um, so we've got, um, I think uh, we're sort of coming, oh, yeah, okay, she says I'm happy. Uh, we're sort of coming towards the end of the event, so um, I'll take these, this couple of questions um, and have you guys answer them and then maybe um, sort of try and close off um, unless anyone has any burning questions um, at the end. So um, here's a question from Sergio Tavares. He says, uh, linked to Rebecca's question, how can the commoditization of migrants be effectively countered in the workplace, especially in, with a recession in the very near prospect? Um, and then we have a question from Mel City. Um, and she says, um, hi, I'm a fast food worker and a striker. I struggle to unionize my workplace. A big part of this is union busting. How does the panel think union busting affects migrant workers and what can we do about it? Um, so I'll ask Sarah to respond first. Uh, yeah, you, do, you guys have come with easy questions. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, the commoditization of migrant worker, how can we end that? It's, if we can, Yeah, okay. So let me let me think, let's put it this way. I think we need to, to start looking at, um, as we were talking about before, to stop framing people as lower and higher skilled by talking about um, the different contribution that they can make in society and having a broader idea about what contribution to society might mean. Francisco was talking about care, the care work is done by, by migrants in a, in a much broader sense than what is usually conceived of. Um, and I think we we can try to, to look at, at migrant contributions to society in a much broader way. So not just um, the way that they, I don't know how much tax revenue they can produce, um, but you know, what are the broader uh, contributions that they can make into society. We are, however, entering the moment of, of you know, where well, we are in, in the biggest recession the UK has seen for, for many decades. Um, so what we'll see is, that, is seeing migrant workers' bodies and and workers' body, generally speaking, as disposable. Uh, people on, on zero contracts um, will be made redundant without, you know, with, with, you know, quite easily, so to speak. Um, and what I think we need to do is to go back 
uh, where we're talking about, you know, involve the, the left in this country and start talking about scrapping a whole number of, of contracts that are not humane. Uh, it cannot enable somebody or anybody to live a sustainable life. Um, so that, I hope that that answers Sergio's answer in a way. Um, so no easy answer, or no easy answer in a way. Don, I want to... Yeah, sorry. Um, in the wisdom yeah. of your experience, maybe make you a better answer. Um, on the, the issue of the commodification of, of, of migrant labour, I mean, you know, that's the same for the rest of the working class as well. You workers fight against the commodification of their lives by um, by basically turning the tables on wage slavery, by giving themselves alternatives other than having to drag themselves out of bed every morning and haul themselves off to some low paid, you know, mind numbing job um, that, that, that that's probably going to contribute to their to their real health. Um, and a lot of that's to do with with having a social security system, an education system, um, loads of things, a care system, um, which basically allows people to lead much fuller lives. Um, but also, I think the other element of it, which I'd really like to see developing as a battle, a trade union battle for the next decade, is a struggle for workers' control. How do we actually take control of the workplaces? Um, how do we how do we redesign love markets um, so that people aren't in you know cutthroat competition with with, with one another? Um, and you know th that's how you. That's how we end the fate of labour from being a commodity, a disposable commodity, and actually return it to the human sphere, um, where it's a part of our, our daily lives and hopefully part of our creativity as well. Um, on the issue of union busting, um, I think, I mean, I, I remember the days going along uh, to the Grunwick strikes, right, way, way, way back. I uh, can't even remember what decade it was in, whether it was the 70s or the, or, or the 80s, but... Um, you know, in those days, we um, where, where workforces, whole new workforces were being busted in by management in order to replace workers who were on strike. Um, that had to be met by two, two, in two ways. One of them was by mass picketing, um, literally tens of thousands of people turning up in order to support the strikers picket line. Um, but also trade union solidarity. Uh, which primarily came through the, the, the what's now the communication workers in those days, the post office workers union that, that paralysed the company um, by, um, by, 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 by holding up their mail. Um, and I think that's to say, we're going to have to reinvent those tactics, um, I think. Um, we're going to have to be able to look at, uh, at disputes when they crop up, whether it's in... Mac and I, I went on the uh, the picket at the when the uh, the McDonald's restaurant in Crayford uh, when they went on strike in support of trade unionism. I turned up for that and was really pleased to see a couple of hundred other people from across East London did that as well. And um, but a lot more of those sort of things, I think, actually turning local struggles for um, for, for union recognition and for rights into core celebs where you. You bring in volunteers, you bring in people who are infused by, by what's going on and who've got to see it as a social justice issue and they're prepared to turn up and, and, and back it. Um, so to do that, we might be able to restore trade unionism to being seen as something positive and worthwhile, something worth investing in rather than a, a almost criminal activity that needs to be clamped down on. That's really great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think um, we're going to try and sort of finish off now. Um, I would really like to encourage everyone um, who's been here today to keep in touch, uh, to get involved. Um, if you want to, um, we've got the Migrants United Facebook page um, where you can find and message us. Um, yeah, Don and Sarah, um, any sort of future event that you have ideas of doing, and hopefully Margaret um, and Manuel as well, um, that would be great. 
Um, and yeah, we just have to keep having these conversations and moving them forward so we can sort of create a better environment um, for migrants. Um, yeah, I just see that Liliana posted on the chat um, the, the group, the Facebook group um, for anyone who wants to keep in touch. So um, I think I just want to sort of give the opportunity for the panelists to make any final remarks and then maybe we'll get a little hello from the audience and goodbye at the same time. Um, so Sarah, um, do you want to start? Um, okay. Uh, well, I think I would want to, to keep encouraging um, people who are not being active in, in trying to, to change the situation of migrants um, to, um, to ask an, a migrant how they can help. Um, you know, anybody who's native who has not been in, engaged in those, in those kind of questions to, you know, to reach out and in a way that is, is humble. Um, and then the more we can do that, um, hopefully we can try to, to um, change the results of next election. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's great. I couldn't have put it better myself. Um, so yeah, I'll just move on to Don. Uh, Don, do you have any final remarks or anything? Is he frozen? He's frozen. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, the, the screen completely froze uh, 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 at that point. Uh, yeah, my um, I think my conclusion would be that people should um, draw up a degree of optimism from the the fact that um, that, that you know migrants um, are a force in society. It's not fashionable to say that we're supposed to be con conditions into thinking that they're marginal and. Um, if we put our mind to it, we could easily expel them from 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 our ranks. Or um, that, that it's that's not the case at all. Um, there are a major feature, not just in in the economy, but I think also the social lives of our community. Um, net, they are part of networks which extend beyond uh, the mark the ranks of migrant the migrants themselves, um, and you know they are potentially a political force in society um, and I think that everything that's going to be happening in the future in the very very immediate future in the medium term and in the long term um, is going to require us to build on on that and um, to find new ways of, of expressing that the power that we already have but also our potential for moving be beyond this point um, and the critical issue is showing demonstrating leadership and um, making the case that the migrant experience is important if we're ever going to get to the bottom of a mess that we've managed to dig ourselves into for our global capitalist civilization then it is going to be require us to draw on the experience of the 250 million migrants from across the planet and make sure that that is represented in the whatever solutions come forward. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really great, um, great final remarks here. Um, so I just want to thank again, um, both of you and all our panelists um, who had to go early to uh, for being here uh, and for taking the time out today. Um, thanks to all of the audience um, and everyone who participated and all of my um, fellow Migrants United uh, comrades who helped organize this event. Um, so yeah, thank you so much everyone and um, have a good rest of the day. If anyone wants to turn on their microphone and say hello, <laughs> that would be a good opportunity now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, no. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thanks a lot. So I hope we have a chance to do it all again. Yes, I hope so. It was a really good discussion. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Um, I really enjoyed it and I found it quite interesting um, to hear the points that all the, some of the lessons we have to learn from the 70s and the 80s and the way we used to organize ourselves and uh, 
uh, but also how different it is and you know we have to learn lessons but the context is very very different and i found it very interesting uh, to be part of this discussion um yeah so i want to thank everybody great thank you thank you Bye. Bye now. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye.